Hi, I'm Brother Robert Walquist. I'm the Gospel Doctrine Instructor in my ward here in Rexburg, Idaho. I also teach at Brigham Young University, Idaho in the Religion Department. And as long as we're in the pandemic, my bishop has asked me to short film a short little Come Follow Me lesson each week for our ward and for anybody else who would like to enjoy it. They're always 30 minutes or less, and now we get to start into the wonderful exploration of the Old Testament. My philosophy is, is to find great gems in our reading for the week and then teach those principles backed up with short excerpts from today's living apostles and prophets. So that's the pattern that I'll use each week. I enjoy doing these, and I hope that you enjoy Come Follow Me, the Old Testament. This first week, starting tomorrow, December 27th, through next Sunday, January 1st, we get to study Moses chapter 1 and Abraham chapter 3, two chapters wonderfully packed with eternal truths, truly worth studying and reading perhaps multiple times in the coming week. Three times early in Moses chapter 1, God says, Moses, my son. Moses, you're in the similitude of mine only begotten. And it sure sounds like Moses is talking with God the Father rather than Jehovah, Jesus Christ, God of the Old Testament. However, in the Pearl of Great Price student manual, it says this, The personage who spoke with Moses was the pre-mortal Jesus Christ, who is Jehovah, God of the Old Testament. Being one with Heavenly Father, Jesus at times speaks as if he were God the Father. This is known as divine investiture, whereby Christ is invested with authority to speak for and in behalf of the Father. Joseph Fielding Smith put it like this, All revelation since the fall has come through Jesus Christ, who is Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, the one who led that nation out of Egyptian bondage and who gave and fulfilled the law of Moses. The Father has never dealt with man directly and personally since the fall, and he has never appeared except to introduce and bear record of the Son. I testify that as we study the Old Testament this year, including in Moses 1 and Abraham 3, that we are talking about Jehovah visiting with Moses and Jehovah, God of the Old Testament. Remember this short little message from President Nelson on the Hear Him campaign, where he reminded us when the Father speaks, he invites us to hear Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, there are very few sacred instances in which the voice of God the Father has been heard. So when he says something, we really need to listen. Repeatedly, he has personally introduced his beloved son, Jesus Christ with a specific charge to hear him. Have you ever stopped to ask why? Why is our Heavenly Father so insistent and consistent in his plea that we should hear his beloved Son, Jesus Christ? Jesus answered this question himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Our Father loves us and yearns for each one of us to choose to return to his holy presence. He pleads with us to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed and appointed as our mediator, savior, and redeemer. I love that message from President Nelson and testify as we study the Old Testament this year, we are studying about the God Jehovah, who is the pre-mortal Jesus Christ. Let's consider two verses of Scripture. Exodus 3, 14, I am that I am, and John 8, 58. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And hast thou seen Abraham? Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am.
it is clear by the reaction of the crowd in John 8 that they knew Jesus was quoting Exodus 3.14. By their reaction when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, they knew he was declaring himself to be Jehovah. What a great and clear message for us to know as we study the Old Testament this year. Elder Holland narrates a great little video that the church put together for Moses chapter 1. Pay attention to insights that you gain from Elder Holland's message of Moses 1. You will recall that the book of Moses begins with Moses being taken up to an exceedingly high mountain. And the glory of God was upon Moses. What then followed was what happens to prophets who are taken to high mountains. He saw God face to face, and he talked with him. my son. Wherefore, look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands. And Moses beheld the earth, yea, even all of it. And there was not a particle of it which he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. This experience is remarkable by every standard. It's one of the great revelations given in human history. But Moses' message to you today is, don't let your guard down. Don't assume that a great revelation, some marvelous illuminating moment, the opening of an inspired path, is the end of it. What happens to Moses next, after his revelatory moment, would be ridiculous if it were not so dangerous, and so absolutely true to form. In an effort to continue his opposition, in his unfailing effort, to get his licks in later, if not sooner, Lucifer appears to Moses after God has revealed himself to the prophet, saying, Moses, son of man, worship me. But Moses is not having it. He has just seen the real thing. And by comparison, this sort of performance is really pretty dismal. Who art thou? For behold, I am a son of God. Where is thy glory that I should worship thee? Blessed be the name of my God, for his spirit hath not altogether withdrawn from me, and I can judge between thee and God. Get thee hence, Satan. Deceive me not. The record then depicts a reaction that is both pathetic and frightening. And now, when Moses had said these words, Satan cried with a loud voice and ranted upon the earth and commanded, saying, I am the only begotten, worship me. And it came to pass that Moses began to fear exceedingly. And as he began to fear, he saw the bitterness of hell. Nevertheless, calling upon God, he received strength. Depart 
it from me, Satan. For this one god only will I worship, which is the god of glory. And now Satan began to tremble, and the earth shook. In the name of the only begotten, depart hence, Satan. And it came to pass that Satan cried with a loud voice, with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and he departed hence. Always to come again, we can be sure, but always to be defeated by the God of glory. Always. I love the message. Behold, thou art my son, wherefore look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands. Truly, the Lord Jehovah showed Moses everything. Let's look at some of the verses from Moses 1 to consider what it was that the Lord showed Moses. Moses beheld the world and the ends thereof. He saw everything. Verse 27, the earth, yea, even all of it, there was not a particle of it which he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. He saw everything, literally, in a miraculous, divine vision. Moses saw it all. He also beheld the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. Everything from Adam to the end of the world, God showed Moses all. What else did Jehovah show Moses? He showed him that there are many worlds like this, and many of those worlds are inhabited. He also showed them that many of those worlds had already passed away before Moses was ever put onto this earth. That he saw the universe. God showed him everything. I love and worship my heavenly Father, and I am saved by the Redeemer Jesus Christ. And I am so grateful that they have the power and the ability to see the beginning from the end and on occasion show it all to prophets. How did Moses react to seeing this? He has a question for the Lord. In fact, two questions for the Lord. Tell me, I pray thee, why these things are so and by what thou madest them. The Lord's response led Moses to say, okay, I have a different question. Tell me concerning this earth. Moses wanted to tell me about the universe and about all those other planets and all those other people. And the Lord says, no, no, Moses, you're on this earth. If you want to know, I'll tell you about this earth. And so Moses fine-tuned his question and said, okay, tell me about this earth. Moses has this incredible, incredible vision. Moses grew up in Egypt. He would have seen incredible workmanship of the hands of mortal humans. When Moses lived in Egypt, the pyramids were already a thousand years old. He would have seen incredible things. And now he sees a vision of God. And after Moses sees this incredible vision, he'd lost all strength for the space of many hours. And finally, when he comes to himself, he says, now for this cause, I know that man is nothing, which thing I never had supposed. I grew up in Egypt, a prince of Egypt, and now I've seen the workmanship of God. Ah, uh, man is nothing. Now, we're going to tie Moses 1 to Abraham 3 a couple of times. Let me start now by tying the vision of Abraham with what Moses saw. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What will happen after I die? Brothers and sisters, we are eternal beings without beginning and without end. We have always existed. We are the literal spirit children of divine, immortal, and omnipotent heavenly parents. We come from the heavenly courts of the Lord our God. We are of the royal house of Elohim, the Most High God. Abraham has this incredible vision of this plan of salvation. And the tidbit three adds is that before we were created as spirit sons and daughters of God, 
we existed in a, in a form called intelligence. We also learn from Abraham chapter 3 about the importance of a great star named Kolob, which is closest to where God lives. You can see the verses here. Kolob's time is God's time. Kolob was the nearest to God's throne. Kolob is the greatest star. And finally, we learn that Kolob is a symbol for the Savior, Jesus Christ, the greatest of all, next to God. Let's talk for just a moment about the word intelligences. Before we became spirit sons and daughters of God, we existed as intelligent matter. We don't know a lot about it, but let me share two quotes. The first comes from the Doctrine and Covenants. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence, or the light of truth, was not created nor made, neither indeed can be, for man is spirit. The elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. Brothers and sisters, we don't know a lot about what we were before we were created as spirit sons and daughters of God, but we know that we've always existed. Here's a quote from Joseph Fielding Smith on intelligence. If the Lord declares that intelligence, something which we do not fully understand, so here's a prophet saying we don't fully understand it, so you can quote him and me, we don't fully understand it, was co-eternal with him and always existed. There is no argument that we can or should present to contradict it. Why he cannot create intelligence is simply because intelligence, like time and space, always existed and therefore did not have to be created. And that's about all we know. But out of that intelligence, whatever it is, we were created as sons and daughters of God. Here are some things then that we know about intelligence. It's an eternal part of man. The scriptures tell us that it can't be created, but it's always existed. Intelligence, at a distant time in the past, acquired a spirit body through the process of birth to heavenly parents. Thus, our spirits had a beginning but our intelligences did not. That's about all we know, but it's a wonderful truth to know. One of the most quoted scriptures in recent general conferences is Abraham 3, verse 25. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. In the book of Abraham, chapter 3, we read, And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them." Close quote. When we came to the earth, we brought with us a great gift from God, even our agency. Instead of giving sympathy, my mother smiled and said, Oh, Hal, of course it's hard. It's supposed to be. Life is a test. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. Prophets have revealed that we first existed as intelligences and that we were given form or spirit bodies by God, thus becoming His spirit children, sons and daughters of heavenly parents. There came a time in this premortal existence of spirits when, in furtherance of His desire that we could have a privilege to advance like Himself, our Heavenly Father prepared an enabling plan. The two principal purposes of the plan were explained to Abraham in these words, And there stood one among them that was like unto God, and he said unto those who were with him, We will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these spirits may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. The real test, in fact, the only test of this life, is will we do what God commands us to do? Now I'd like to combine an insight from Moses 1 and Abraham 3. This was connected for me in October of 2019 from Elder Gary E. Stevenson's talk, Deceive Me Not. 
Listen for him to talk about the great message of Satan confronting Moses right after Moses has seen God. And Satan is cast out by Moses in the name of the only begotten. And then Elder Stevenson teaches this grand truth. Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain. He saw God face to face and he talked with him. God taught Moses about his eternal identity. Though Moses was mortal and imperfect, God taught that Moses was in the similitude of mine only begotten and mine only begotten shall be the Savior. Listen carefully to what happened as this wondrous vision closed. And it came to pass that Satan came tempting him, saying, Moses, son of man, worship me. Moses courageously replied, Who art thou? For behold, I am, an a, son, I am a son of God in the similitude of his only begotten. And where is thy glory that I should worship thee? In other words, Moses said, You cannot deceive me, for I know who I am. I was created in the image of God. You don't have his light and glory, so why should I worship you or fall prey to your deception? I invite you to respond the same way when you feel influenced by temptation. Command the enemy of your soul by saying, Go away. You have no glory. Do not tempt me or lie to me, for I know I am a child of God and I will always call upon my God for his help. The way is simple. Through his servants, God speaks to us, his children, and gives us commandments. We could restate the verse I just quoted to say, I, the Lord, called upon my servant, President Russell M. Nelson, and spake unto him from heaven and gave him commandments. Isn't that a glorious truth? Brothers and sisters, that's powerful. Just as Moses was a prophet of God, Elder Stevenson's reminding us that President Russell M. Nelson has been spoken to by the Lord from heaven and gave unto him commandments. Isn't that a glorious truth? When the prophet speaks, he speaks for the Lord just as much as Moses did. Another great teaching from Abraham chapter 3 is the idea of when God created spirit sons and daughters, he gathered them together and some of them excelled in their growth in the premortal world as spirit sons and daughters of God and became part of what the scriptures call the noble and great ones. Abraham was identified as one of those noble and great ones. In October 2013, President Nelson cites Abraham 3 and says this profound truth. Your spirit is an eternal entity. The Lord said to his prophet Abraham, Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. The Lord said something similar about Jeremiah and many others. He even said it about you. Your heavenly Father has known you for a very long time. You as his son or daughter were chosen by him to come to earth at this precise time to be leaders in his great work on earth. You were chosen not for your bodily characteristics, but for your spiritual attributes, such as bravery, courage, integrity of heart, thirst for truth, hunger for wisdom, and a desire to serve others. You develop some of these attributes pre-mortally, Others you can develop here on earth as you persistently seek them. I love that teaching from the prophet of God. Now let's conclude by tying together the great truth at the conclusion of both of these chapters. Moses 1, 39, God's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Here's a short clip from President Ballard where he contrasts God's work and glory to the work and glory of Satan. If Heavenly Father's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men and women, Lucifer's work is to bring to pass the misery and endless woe for God's children. 
Now take the simple truth from President Uchtdorf, who reminded us in 2011 that we matter to him in all of the grand universe of God with so many wonderful creations. Because we are his spirit daughters and his spirit sons, we matter to him. Brothers and sisters, the most powerful being in the universe is the father of your spirit. He knows you. He loves you with a perfect love. God sees you not only as a mortal being on a small planet who lives for a brief season. He sees you as his child. He sees you as the being you are capable and designed to become. He wants you to know that you matter to him. Now take a close look at verse 17 of chapter 3. I love that there is nothing that the Lord thy God shall take into his heart to do, but what he will do it. His work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And if he has taken that into his heart to do, he will do it. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ won. He won the victory. He conquered death. All of us who have come to this earth will live again. Jesus Christ brought about the universal resurrection for every human soul. And now, through covenants and ordinances in sacred and holy temples, we can return and live with God again. Today we often hear about a new normal. If you really want to embrace a new normal, I invite you to turn your heart, mind, and soul increasingly to our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Let that be your new normal. That is why we have temples. The Lord's ordinances and covenants prepare us for eternal life the greatest of all of God's blessings. Through covenants and ordinances received in holy temples, we can have eternal life with God. Perhaps my week before Christmas was a lot like your week. Keeping the ice skating rink smooth, covered in ice, keeping the snow shape. Wait, maybe some of you aren't shoveling snow off your backyard ice rink, but I did a lot of that this last week. But there was Christmas service and lots of beautiful things that reminded us of the Savior. And I didn't get around to come follow me until December 26th. I'm so glad I waited. Our bishop's daughter sang, Oh, Holy Night, at the conclusion of our sacrament meeting today. And it changed my heart and made me think of the incredible lyrics for this hymn as a way to end the first part of the, our Old Testament study. Look at some of the lyrics. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt its worth. And let us remember, as again sung in this hymn, chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. All of us on this planet are sons and daughters of the most high God. Let's, in 2022, act like that. End prejudice, end bigotry, end racism, and act like we belong together, because we do.